Hello and welcome back to Moffat Field. I'm going to take a look at another post-mortem war room game, two-on-two -two global map, global scenario. Um, as the title says, the Axis almost won. It was pretty close, probably one turn away and just a few units away until it was called because it was too obvious that the Allies were going to win. But what happened was we had a successful sea lion. Uh, the units that start in Norway, Germany, and France moved into A6 on turn one. And subsequently took British one, or London, UK, on turn two. Uh, the British fleet that was here, the was it uh, battleship and cruiser, were defeated with the German Air Force, which is no longer on the map. And uh, so that immediately sent, caused eight stress points on the UK. Uh, I think it sent it into this first, uh, the first block here, which is labor unions and civil unrest. So immediately out of the out of the gate, London was losing three resources. There was no strategic bombing this round other than uh, the Germans bombed Germany itself once the British overtook it. And the Japanese bombed Moscow to try and disrupt the rail network. Stop the video for a second and go through a little bit of the technicalities of uh, the move of Sea Lion, at least this version of it. This is the movement card for Germany on turn one. It uh, included the Navy, some Air Force, and uh, the ground forces. So, first of all, the first Navy moved to A6. A6 is essentially the English Channel. The 5th Navy moved to A6, and the 3rd Navy can't make it to A6. It starts over, um, I think, in uh, off the coast of uh, Brazil or something like that. So I moved it to A15, just to, as a potential next hit if it, requir if, it, if it was required the next turn to move to A6, if the battle wasn't successful in A6, if the British fleet wasn't sunk in A6. The all available air forces were sent to A6, the 13th, the 11th, and the 14th. And on our cards, to keep things straight and clear too, we also put N for Navy, A for Air Force, L for Land, and sometimes T for Transport if the, if the stack is in the water. It helps keep track also and avoid confusion. So basically, Germany used all nine movement allocations to move everybody into the English Channel that could make it. Um, that's why Russia was able to move into Germany so easily because Germany was not able to consolidate of the any of the stacks that were sitting in Germany. Um, all the movement was consumed for Sea Lion. So that's the German uh, movement card from turn one. This is the Italian movement card. Pretty simple. As you can see here, Italy can only move six out of the box. Uh, any air forces that were available were moved to A6, basically from Italy and the Bal uh, Balkans. And the land troops that were stationed in Italy were moved into M1 or M2 to either move to North Africa or to take Gibraltar. Finally, here's the Japanese first turn movement card. I made a mistake on this move actually. Instead of moving to P19, I moved all the navies by accident to P18. There was still a British fleet there to sink, a small one, but I was hoping to get the American fleet and I missed it because I moved to the wrong space. It happens in this game more often than you would think or, uh, or you write the wrong number or whatever. It happens pretty frequently. Um, the other moves are pretty basic. The only move I want to call out is the 44th to P14. That's that first stack of infantry, tank, and artillery that come out of 
Tokyo and can start moving their way south pretty much unhindered unless that British fleet is not taken care of. So again, this is the, at least in this game, the turn one Japanese movement. Here's a shot of a sea lion after turn one and before turn two. You can see the three German infantry tank artillery stacks in the English Channel and the remaining uh, the remaining German Navy that survived in A6. And you can see the British moved one of their fleets from A7 down next to Spain. And the Russians did not move their Navy into A6, which was a little bit of a concern because it would have been harder to knock out that Navy in A6 had that Russian Navy come down from, I believe it's A1. And also see the German and Italian air forces that landed back in Germany. And the Italian fleet is just visible. 114 that's sitting next to uh, Spain as well in the Mediterranean. Here's a shot a little farther east showing Germany. Again, the units couldn't move out of Germany. One can see that Russia took Finland and has positioned additional troops closer to Germany and they will invade next turn as Germany takes London. Here's a quick shot of the Mediterranean showing the Italians moving into M2. Quick shot of the Pacific. One can see the Japanese navies sitting in P18. That a mistaken move should have been P19. And one can see the American Navy escaped up next to Russia to space Pacific 2, P2. Final shot before back to the video. This is, these are the combat results from turn one. The British lost a battleship and a cruiser in A6. And in P18, they lost a blue cruiser and a yellow sub. So that's the Navy there. The Chinese, I think, attacked the Japanese and lost a, an infantry. The Japanese lost uh, the cruiser and the sub in the attack against the British. And then the Germans lost, looks like a cruiser and a couple subs attacking the British Navy in A6. And then uh, the Finnish war took out, a, took out some Russians and some Germans. So that's what this board is representing. Now back to the video. Uh, so that was round two that London fell. Then Germany pressed on immediately to Russia, but by then Russia had already pushed into the Baltic, Belarus. Uh, they never took the Ukraine, but Russia was able to push all the way into Hungary, Germany, France, Italy, the Balkans. Meanwhile, Germany was pushing towards Moscow. Uh, Germany quickly also fell into the no rail loss movement orders and ended up in no resource income. But it almost didn't matter. So what if the Soviets took Germany? Uh, the Germans could keep pushing towards Moscow with, with Japanese and Italian help. And if they took it, that's game over. Pretty much because the Russians probably wouldn't be able to get everybody back to take Moscow. Uh, it so happened that this was a build that was in Moscow, retreated out, and then came back in. Of course, the Americans flew in their their air into Moscow. And the main reason the Axis called it quits is that it looks like a pretty fair fight this round that the Axis might take it. But in fact, um, 67 would rail in 43 would rail into the spot into Moscow. Quite a few of these could rail over right into Moscow. The Axis were not able to destroy the rail links, unfortunately. 
So, yeah, game over at that point. There's just not enough momentum. The Italians were pretty good in Africa. They were able to get into the Middle East. Japan was able to get into Russia through India. I'll cover that in a second. But if we look at Africa, once Britain fell, they didn't have much to fight with. So the Italians were able to split their stack here into like three or four different units and pretty much take out most of Africa. This guy left Italy, uh, ended up over here in A16 and tried to go back into M2, but the orders were miswritten and it couldn't go from A16 to M2. It could only go to M1, so that was a canceled order. And then, uh, so 114 came down here with the hopes of maybe taking Gold Coast, Nigeria. I thought that would never happen, but we came pretty close this turn, this game. Again, uh, once Italy fell, there's no more uh, Italian factories to build. So Italy just kept started spreading out, actually pushing, pushing the British into mass desertions. We didn't get to actually see that happen, but it looks like according to the rules, every stress level causes a unit to a desert to the Axis side. Didn't need to go and review the rules exactly. Not sure exactly how that happens, which units uh, desert. Looking over in India, Japan was able to take India pretty easily with, uh, with the Air Force you now see up here in, um, uh, what's this space? Volga. All these Japanese planes that you see more or less helped take India with most of the units that just came down from, from locally from China. The Japanese didn't worry too much about the Chinese this game. Pretty much just went for India and started pushing over to Russia in hopes that maybe they could get there in time to assist with, with taking out... Um, taking out Eastern Russia, Central Russia, and pushing on to Moscow. Again, the Chinese, looks like they pushed down into Thailand. Uh, there were a couple garrison rolls, lucky garrison rolls, two blues, that destroyed a couple of these, uh, of the artillery. One thing we always try to remember is the garrison rolls. It's easy to forget that when you move into an empty space, that, you know, especially over in Africa, all these required garrison rolls. Luckily, there were no double hits, so on the garrison rolls, you need a double yellow, double blue, double green, which is pretty difficult. In fact, I've been working on a on a odds chart, so actually the odds of rolling uh, double yellows, two yellows on two dice is 11%, two blues on two dice is, I believe, six and, six and a quarter. Uh, to kill a tank would be about a 3% chance. So garrison's pretty difficult. So that was a pretty lucky roll over here to wipe out those two of the Chinese artillery. Uh, once again, this 41 is coming around through the Malaysia from starting off in Japan. Two moves per turn. Heading for India or can always land in here. The Allied player could have sunk this with this carrier fighter, I believe. If they had flown it to I-9, it would have sunk this defenseless transport. But uh, the Allied general missed that one, luckily. They did prevent 41 from moving into I-10 by flying this fighter down, which was over here in China before. So they were able to block that move, which was pretty good. Sending beasts, sending uh, this fighter group 16 into I-10. Not much else happened down here in the in uh, Australia. The American fleet uh, consolidated here in what is that P-19, and the Japanese fleet 
pretty much just protecting the homeland here with three carriers and a bunch of uh, bunch of other ships. 81 was on its way to Russia, break the uh, eventually break the Molotov Pact. And 24 is protecting Beijing. In terms of America, not much happened here, just, you know, building and pushing stacks across the Atlantic to help the Russians. Perhaps maybe put some pressure on London if possible, if, it, if the game had continued. Um, the Italians were also able to take Gibraltar, allowing this fleet to come out of the Mediterranean. It sunk a couple U.S. stacks like this that were down here trying to get to Africa. This fleet was able to take out a few of those. Um, it is difficult for the Axis to protect this corridor here, though. Um, something to work on in the future is how to get a Navy up here to protect this. It's tough with the Americans. They could always build something quickly in A-10 and hit any German fleet up here. And again, in terms of trading, uh, this Japanese fleet's sitting in I-1 so that the Axis can trade. Otherwise, it's pretty hard to get, uh, get rid of the Axis oil. Okay, I think that's about it. Um, so we had a successful, just wrap it up, we had a successful sea lion first time. Um, just a note for everybody, you always try to remember those garrison rolls when you're moving into, into empty territories, those two dice. Um, another little tip, I don't know if I mentioned this before, but we also, what we like to do is keep these carrier planes on the stack. It just makes it easy to remember that you have a carrier or two sitting in there. So instead of keeping them up here in the storage zone, just drop the carriers and keep them on, on the stack itself. It's much clearer for everybody as to what's actually in that stack. And finally, if you have the expansion set or somehow you've had these boards, uh, I would suggest you clean them every night because... Uh, sorry, I got cut off there because the boards will stain or the it'll be hard to clean them later and i don't know if you're picky or not but you'll get you know they'll start to get black if you don't clean them uh, regularly or or don't don't let them sit at the end of a game for weeks with the with the uh, ink still on them just wipe them off at the end of the game just something just something i learned uh so let me know if you think uh if you want to see more of these videos, these post-mortem videos on gameplay and what kind of things we're seeing, this was definitely a more interesting game today. It looks like the Axis, you know, we were kind of uh, down on the Axis that they didn't have much opportunity, but there might be some, some uh, interesting plays here. There was a house rule I was going to mention that we're thinking about too. Oh, you know, you can't repair facilities and you can't repair damaged facilities, but it's pretty easy to damage a facility. It's pretty easy to knock out the rail. It only requires one white, I think, or one black. And the, and that's, so that's a one in 12. There's one white and one black per die, so a one in 12. If you send in a couple bombers, they get four dice each. It's most, bombing raids are successful in causing damage to a factory or and permanently wiping out the rail system. So we're going to play some more games, but just wondering if anyone has that same experience that it seems too easy to knock out this rail and the rails very valuable. So not being able to repair that might be too restrictive. So a house rule we're thinking about is maybe having some kind of repair on the on the facilities and the rail. You know, it would cost some iron, maybe some uh, goods, some of the other goods to represent lumber and feeding crews or something like that. But that's something we're we're starting to think about is how to uh, if you, if one should be allowed to rebuild. All right, that's it. Let me know your comments. Let me know if you want to see more videos like this. If it's interesting or not. And uh, we'll see how the future games go. Cheers.